So this, the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, um, is the Buddha's analysis of what constitutes a person. And you'll, you'll see, and as, we, as you saw in the uh, last Saturday, um, there's nothing personal about a person. It's just a, a simple um, combination of common elements that is part of every human being, in fact, part of the entire, entire universe, except maybe the consciousness part. Um, and it's important, and I stress this often, to see this in context of what the Buddha taught. Uh, this is another one of those suttas. If you just happen to read it out of context, you think this guy's crazy. What does it mean? He's not making any sense at all. But understanding the context, it is one of the most brilliant teachings and most important teachings in all of the Sutta Pitaka. Uh, the Buddha did not see himself as a savior. He didn't try to teach a salvific religion or really a religion in any sense. Uh, he didn't try to teach um, the creation of the universe or um, describe in any way a creative force in the universe. He did not try to uh, encourage people to look towards non-physical establishment such as a heaven as a reward for a life well lived. What he taught is to understand what is going on right now. You could really characterize the Buddha's teachings by saying he wasn't concerned about what was, he was concerned about what is. He wasn't concerned about what may be, he was concerned about what is, meaning what is going on right now is where awakening occurs. So the Buddha awakened to dependent origination. I'm going to review it once more, just for context. That states from, and let me preface that by, by notice, and I, and I do this often when I'm talking about dependent origination, notice that there's, there's no aspect of dependent origination that would um, suggest interdependence. They're two different words, aren't they? Dependence and interdependence are two completely different meanings. Although most of modern Buddhism insists that the Buddha was teaching interdependence from dependent origination, sometimes called dependent co-arising. The teachers that will espouse that don't even reference the, the suttas where the Buddha teaches this, but that's another story. He didn't try to teach that we are all interconnected. In one sense we are, but that's irrelevant to the Dhamma. He certainly didn't teach as one modern famous teacher teaches that we interbe meaning basically that we're all one organism. In fact, and to understand what the Buddha is teaching, it's important to see all phenomena arising discreetly of other phenomena. And the importance of that is what I'm gonna cite the sutta in just a moment. The importance of that is noticing our relationship with phenomena arising and passing away. And the, the ultimate release from wrong views is release from clinging to self-referential phenomena. And so this idea that we're interdependent, interconnected, interbe is completely contradictory to letting go of clinging in, in any way. In fact, it encourages clinging. The Buddha awakened to dependent origination, which states from ignorance of four noble truths, fabrications arise. It is normally stated as, as from ignorance of four noble truths as a requisite condition, fabrications come to be. Fabrications are a corrupted or a distorted or perverted way of looking at reality. We simply don't understand what's occurring because our views are rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. And that, I know that's very basic, but is that clear to everyone? And that's really the entire premise of the Buddha's Dhamma, to take us from ignorance of four noble truths and a fabricated view of ourselves in relation to the world that is always prone to, to stress and suffering to a, a view of the world rooted in wisdom, seeing things clearly through right discernment or right view. From fabrications as a requisite condition comes consciousness. Notice the progression. From ignorance of Four Noble Truths comes a fabricated view of the world that's feeding consciousness. And again, this isn't a grand cosmic consciousness. It's simply, in this sense, it's ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths informed by fabrication. So anything that, that consciousness considers is gonna be clouded by that fabricated view of the world. Clear? From consciousness as a requisite condition comes name and form. Name and form is a, is a uh, in, in Pali is Namarupa. It simply means I am now identifying with this form. 
again, notice the progression. The progression leading to this self-identification is rooted in what? Fabrications, which are themselves arising from ignorance. So I'm not seeing myself clearly. Again, this is the heart of the Buddhist teaching, to go from a wrong view of self, anatta, to a right view of self. Nowhere in the Buddha's teaching does he teach there's no such thing as a self. He's simply teaching that the views we're holding of a self are wrong views. Let go of those views. From name and form as a requisite condition comes the sixth sense base. Our five physical senses in that sixth sense consciousness. And this is what we interpret the world with. And if that interpretation is rooted in ignorance and informed by fabrications, we are going to be using our senses in a way that can only reaffirm ignorance. Clear? Simple, too, when you look at it this way, isn't it? From the sixth sense base comes contact. You remember the series we did on the, on the wisdom of restraint. It is at the sixth sense base that we can either continue ignorance or see things clearly. And I'll get to that. That's what the sutta is about in, in one respect. At the sixth sense base, we can either continue ignorance by seeing things from a fabricated point of view or at the sixth sense base, informed by wisdom, rooted in refined mindfulness, we can turn our minds towards awakening. And it is at this point of contact. From contact as a requisite condi condition comes feeling. Obvious, isn't it? And so that feeling, again, this is gonna be touched on in the sutta, that's why I'm going through this here. That feeling or reaction in the mind, if it's rooted in ignorance, only creates further craving, clinging, and maintaining. If that feeling, <clears throat> And feeling isn't good or bad, by the way. If that feeling is informed by wisdom, meaning seeing what's occurring clearly and understanding what's occurring within me, in a mind resting in equanimity, that only continues towards an awakened mind. <clears throat> From feeling as a requisite condition comes craving. Makes sense, doesn't it? This, again, notice the context. From ignorance to a mind rooted in that ignorance, comes into contact with the world, we decide we'd like something or don't like something, and that creates craving. I want more of it, I want less of it, still craving. From craving as a requisite condition comes clinging and maintaining. Now that I've, I've self-identified or self-referenced myself to phenomena, ordinary phenomena, but decided I like this or I don't like that, or I'm ambiguous to it, I've now created an identity rooted in Consciousness gives rise to name and form, to self-identity. It's within that thinking that I've self-identified myself with phenomena and, and said, this is me or this is what I need to be happy. You follow the progression? Mm -hmm. Yeah. From clinging and paint maintaining as a requisite condition comes becoming. And there's not a modifier there. And a lot of scholars question why that is. There's no question because if you look at it in context, in the context of ignorance giving rise to this, to this whole progression, clinging and maintaining as a requisite condition comes becoming further ignorant. Unless something is, is developed to interrupt that ignorance. That's the Eightfold Path. From becoming as a requisite condition comes birth. And again, the Buddha is not interested in, in, in describing some type of universal creation myth, although most people, most modern Buddhists say that's exactly what dependent origination and they talk about this, this uh, th three lifetime development. This is based on something called the Abhidhamma, which has nothing to do with what the Buddha taught, although much of Theravadan Buddhism rests on that book. What the Buddhist, in context, what the Buddha is talking about giving birth to is not physical birth or even a future birth, but giving birth to another moment rooted in what? Rooted in ignorance. From clinging and maintaining comes becoming, from becoming further ignorant as a requisite condition comes the birth of another moment rooted in ignorance. And that points to the singular importance of a useful meditation practice that deepens concentration so that I can develop that refined mindfulness to know what's occurring right now. Because once I gain control of my mind in the present moment, not in the past, not in the future, in what's occurring right now, then I can give birth to a moment that is inclined towards awakening. And if I don't have control of my mind, the only thing I can do through continued distraction 
whether it's within something I might call Buddhist practice or not, is give birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. The Eightfold Path provides a framework and guidance to deliver the potential that each moment has. And the potential that each moment has within the Buddha's Dhamma is to, to incline the mind towards further ignorance or incline the mind towards awakening. From birth as a requisite condition comes, and I won't go through the whole list, comes the entire mass of stress and suffering, confusion, deluded, deluded thinking, and suffering, dukkha. And that relates directly to the Four Noble Truths. The Four, the four Noble Truths describe, the, states that dukkha occurs as a result of ignorance. It, the, the second Noble Truth is that craving originates and clinging perpetuates suffering. Notice the relation to dependent origination. The third noble truth is that cessation of this process is possible. And the fourth noble truth is the truth of the path leading to the cessation of all manner of suffering. So obviously the Eightfold Path is a path taught by the Buddha to recognize and abandon suffering. When he describes an awakened human being from the point of view of right view, he describes that human being as having developed a profound understanding of suffering. That's all the Buddha was concerned about. And that that understanding was developed through the Eightfold Path, resulting in a mind of calm. Is that clear so far? Yeah. And the, and the, you see how that encapsulates and informs the entire Buddha Dhamma by understanding those two things, dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths. Everything the Buddha taught during his entire 45-year teaching career was taught in the context of just that thing, just those two things. So this is from the Mula Sutta and it relates to becoming and it relates to exactly to what we're talking about. Monks, if those of other sects ask you, in what are all phenomena rooted? How do they come into play? What is their origination? How are they established? What is their foundation? What is their governing principle? What is their defining state? What is their heartwood? Where do they gain their footing? And what is their cessation? On being asked this, you should reply. Let me just stop. So the, again, the Buddha is not interested in describing a creation myth, meaning how all phenomena came into being, rooted in ignorance from a fabricated view, how does phenomena come into being? This is how you should reply. All phenomena are rooted in desire. And the, 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 one of the suttas on, in the series of becoming states very clearly, the Loka Sutta, that if there's desire, there's fear. And I won't get too deep into that, but I think you recognize that, excuse me. If you're craving for anything, there's going to be at least a subtle fear that you won't get it. And if you've already acquired it and you're clinging to it, there's a subtle fear always that you're going to lose it. That's stress. That's what medical science in the last 25 or 30 years are finally recognizing what a debilitating effect stress has on all of our lives. And it's, and it's those very subtle levels of stress that we don't even recognize that, that the Buddha gets to the heart of recognizing and abandoning it. All phenomena come into play through attention. And in this translation, attention really means clinging. All phenomena that's going to cause stress in my life comes into play by my clinging to it. All phenomena have contact as their origination. Makes sense, doesn't it? And if my contact with phenomena is rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths and fabricated, the phenomena is going to fuel further ignorance. It originates in that and it continues through that. All phenomena have feeling as their establishment. Again, relating to dependent origination and contact giving rise to feeling. Now I'm clinging to it. And in this chapter, which sutta are you doing? This is the, the uh, Mula Sutta, okay. just as an introduction to it today. I see. Okay. All phenomena have concentration as their foundation. It points to the, another aspect of the Buddha's Dhamma and the importance of developing concentration. What we what we concentrate on, this is another aspect of mindfulness, is going to determine our experience of it. So it's by clinging to ordinary phenomena through a fabricated view, another aspect of concentration that creates all manner of suffering. All phenomena have mindfulness as their governing principle. And that point also points to the way out. The refined mindfulness that's developed through the Buddha's Dhamma takes us from a fabricated view of reality, of the Four Noble Truths, of phenomena, 
to a non-fabricated, seeing phenomena clearly. And de depending on what type of mindfulness we're developing, that will govern our experience of it. Mindfulness is the governing principle. So th this also relates in a not entirely indirect way, in fact, a rather direct way, to the modern mindfulness movement, which basically and very simply teaches that mindfulness means that we should hold in mind whatever's occurring. We should be mindful of what's going on. And that's a, that's a good thing, except when we introduce that type of mindfulness as Dhamma practice, because it's not. That type of mindfulness is simply clinging awareness. We're clinging to whatever's occurring. And if there's no way of recognizing self-reference in it, we're only going to continue ignorance with that type of mindfulness. Mindfulness meditation is generally taught that way to come and do whatever you want to do to quiet your mind and then simply be mindful of what's arising and passing away in an analytical or noticing way. Again, that's just clinging awareness. We know through the four foundations of mindfulness and the Buddhist teaching on meditation, whatever thoughts and feelings arise, we notice that the distraction and not analyze it, not pick at it, not cling to it, come back to the sensation of breathing. That's what deepens concentration and supports refined mindfulness. So all phenomena have mindfulness as their governing principle, including the phenomena of the Eightfold Path, which is a phenomena. So phenomena is not good or bad, but it's a phenomena developed by an awakened human being that through refined mindfulness, we can govern our own awakening. Clear? Okay. All phenomena have discernment as their defining state. All phenomena have release as their heart would. So with the, what's that, what that is saying is that Despite the fabricated view of the phenomena that we're caught up in, it is within that fabricated view rooted in ignorance that the Eightfold Path develops awakening. That's the heartwood. The heartwood is present within ordinary phenomena, including the phenomena that I'm going to get to, hopefully. Uh, all phenomena gain footing in impermanence. All phenomena, including the Eightfold Path, by the way, including the Four Noble Truths. All phenomena gain footing in impermanence, meaning there's nothing personal, no matter how much we want to describe things that way, it's all impermanent. It's like foam on the ocean. There's, there's nothing of, of true substance there. All phenomena have unbinding as their cessation. If we want to stop being distracted and stressful over phenomena, it's recognizing the wrong views and unbinding from those wrong views. That's the cessation of suffering. All phenomena have unbinding as their cessation. So um, before I, I don't want to get into deep, too long of a discussion, but are there any questions about what I just covered and how it relates to the Datu Habanga Sutta? Well, I'll, I'll get into that right now. So we're about halfway through this sutta. The beginning half, the, the, the Buddha describes the, the six properties that describe a person. Earth, fire, wind, water, space, and consciousness. And of course, we can all agree with that. That's what makes us, we might want to say, well, that's us, and there's also passion. Well, passion, if it's rooted in desire, leads to fear. In other words, we might use, in addition to what the Buddha is describing a person, conceptual applications of what a person is. But when you look at it clearly, and in the context of the Buddha Dhamma, these are the six properties that describe all of us, right? The four, if the five physical properties if we include space and consciousness as that, as that sixth property. Yes. What about personality? Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's, uh, that's what I meant by, by passion or what might describe, what we might describe ourselves as is something that has arisen within this, these six properties that is arbitrary and chaotic. It, it, it's a result of our inner, of the individual's interaction with the world and their sense of eye making. And we can all, we can all describe that. So a personality is something that is an embellishment on these six properties. The feedback of consciousness and life. All yes. Of Phenomena. Phenomena. Just like the Buddha described <laughs> in the Gara Sutta. So what we what we consider the, the personality, another word for that is an ego or an ego personality. That's an aspect of the not self characteristic. It's something that we 
have developed and described to, to establish ourselves in ignorance of four noble truths. Mm -hmm. And notice, this, again, this is, we're talking about developing an understanding of the Dhamma. There are people that would claim, and, and it's understandable that in order to operate in the world, we need to have an ego. We need to have some way of, of bringing ourselves into the world and interacting with the world. The Buddha struggled with that too. That's part of the Nagara Sutta. And what he realized is that that thing that we cling to tenaciously and say that we need it to survive simply gets in the way and causes stress. And the, the best example of that, of living an incredibly successful life free of an ego personality is the Buddha himself. And he, he directed kings and leaders. He wasn't, he wasn't just some guy sitting under a tree his whole life. He was deeply involved in everybody's life. And he lived, I think, the most successful human life ever, free of an ego personality. So it seems like we got to have this, but we don't. Um, and so the Buddha describes that, those properties, to point out the complete ordinariness of, of human life. That's what we all are. There's nothing special. There's nothing, nothing personal about any of that, except as we start interpreting things as dependent origination states through those impersonal properties. And so then the Buddha says that there's uh, 18, 18 considerations leading to four determinations and those went through that. The considerations are uh, when I, through the earth property, feeling pleasure, feeling pain or, or, or equanimity and going through those properties, you remember that? Mm -hmm. So we have a choice in each and every moment at that point of restraint, at, or at that point of contact, to practice restraint or not. Restraint is, in this sense, is having developed that refined mindfulness to simply see the arising and passing away of painful or pleasurable experiences as simply impersonal and a consequence of having a human life and maintaining that mind of equanimity or reacting to pleasure or pain in a personal way. That's what the, and I'm going to go back. I think I ended here. I'm just going to go back to this from last week. So the Buddha's just going through the five properties. Now he's describing the, the consciousness property, but exactly more or less the same way. And what is the consciousness property? Consciousness free of fabrication remains pure and bright. He's, he's teaching Pukasati here that the ultimate goal of, of consciousness is not something to be discarded, but to develop within the framework of the Eightfold Path. What is perceived by consciousness? One perceives pleasure, one perceives pain, one perceives neither pleasure nor pain. In dependence on sensory contact, that is to be felt as pleasure, there arises a feeling of pleasure. That, that line that, that is to be felt as pleasure is, relates to the second factor of the Eightfold Path, which is either right intention or wrong intention. Wrong intention is the intention to continue craving, clinging, and maintaining. And if that intention is what's in our mind now to continue craving for and clinging to those things that are giving pleasure that is entering into the world or into a situation in a way that is to be felt as pleasure i'm craving after pleasure due to self-identification one perceives i am sensing a feeling of pleasure do you see the trouble in that the difficulty the, the, the stress because of self-identification i'm happy but you're basing your happiness on something that is impermanent, mm. fleeting, no matter what it is. And underneath that acquisition, there's always going to be fear because we know it. Deep down, we know it. Um, I'm going to touch over that. In dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as pain, there arises a feeling of pain. That's another side of the other side of the same coin of craving is aversion. And so I have the intention of going into something expecting it to be disappointing or painful rather than knowing that it is only through self-identification that I'm, I'm inflicting that second arrow, the Salata Sutta, remember the Salata Sutta, of self-referential views now bouncing back against my own consciousness. Due to self-identification, one perceives I am sensing a feeling of pain. In dependence on sensory contact that is to be felt as neither pleasure nor pain, there arises a feeling of neither pleasure nor pain. Due to self-identification, one perceives I am sensing neither pleasure nor pain. That's usually, to, it's just an ambiguous state, usually 
felt as boredom. And usually a self-referential ego self wants to get out of that state very quickly and will grasp at anything, even something painful to get out of that state of boredom. Through refined mindfulness, one understands that with the cessation of self-identification of that very sensory contact, the feeling of pleasure has arisen independently of that contact. And remember the, 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 the context, this is contact rooted in self-referential views arising from ignorance of Four Noble Truths. But when that mind has let go of all those views, it's simply what's arising. And so a beautiful sunset is a beautiful sunset. I don't need another one because I haven't self-identified with it. A nice piece of chocolate cake is simply that. A pleasant conversation is simply that. An unpleasant conversation is simply that. A stale piece of cake is simply that. A lousy sunset is just that. There's no self-identification with it. It's simply what's arising. It's what is, not what was or what should be. Clear? It's not a creation myth. We're not trying to manipulate what's going on in the world like some misinformed God. This is simply what's occurring. And no matter what's occurring, because I understand through profound wisdom, I'm at peace with it. I'm not taking anything personal. It's, it's simply an, the ordinariness of life experienced through these six properties. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. I can't see that's why. Yeah. What is to be felt as pleasure ceases. It is stilled. In other words, we're not grasping at it anymore. It's just, it's just what we're experiencing. I'm going to skip over some of my commentary. Through refined mindfulness, one understands that with the cessation of self-identification of that very sensory contact, excuse me, the feeling of pain has arisen independently of that contact. What is to be felt as pain ceases. It is set, it is still. How does a Buddha describe an awakened, the quality of an awakened mind? Calm, still. Through refined mindfulness, one understands that with the cessation of self-identification of that very sensory contact, the feeling of neither pleasure nor pain has arisen independently of that contact. What is to be felt as neither pleasure nor pain ceases, is still. Relating also to the Salata Sutta. So a mind that's constantly grasping after distraction can't stand something that is not grabbing at its attention. It, 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 boredom is one of the worst things to that type of mind. And I think we've all experienced that. One of the difficulties in beginning a meditation practice is it's just so damn boring. How can I continue to do this even for a minute or two in the beginning? That's that quality of mind that needs to be constantly, constantly distracted. But a mind resting in equanimity is simply resting in equanimity. And so that calm moment that previously was excruciatingly boring is now just peaceful. In fact, all of life is that way. Do you see what, that this, this is where this suit is going and what it, why it's describing a person in these six properties? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> just as when two, the Buddha continues, just as when two sticks are brought together and agitated, heat and fire are born dependent on contact and agitation. When the sticks are separated and the agitation ceases, heat subsides and the fire is extinguished. The, the word nirvana or nibbana means just that. It, it means extinguished. It means the, the, the fires of passion rooted in ignorance have been extinguished. That's awakening as the Buddha describes awakening. In the same manner, an agitated mind, lacking concentration, independence on contact, will feel feelings of pleasure, feelings of pain, or feelings of neither pleasure nor pain. Those are the only three choices we have, by the way. <clears throat> A wise Dhamma practitioner understands that with the cessation of self-referential sensory contact, Feelings of pleasure or pain or neither pleasure nor pain are still. A mind that is distracted and agitated to a mind that is calm and at peace. The same situation will be there. The difference is in the quality of our mind. Now there remains only a mind established in equanimity, luminous, pure, supple and spacious, 
just as if a skillful goldsmith were to take raw gold and through skillful effort trans transform this raw gold into a refined and flawless ornament, malleable and, new and luminous. The gold would now suit the goldsmith's purpose. The Buddha is re now referring to the Vitaka Santana Sutta. We'll gain the ability to think what we want to think when we want to think it. Whatever is appropriate is what we'll be holding in mind. In this same manner, one whose mind is established in equanimity, luminous, pure, supple, and spacious, knows that if I were to direct my thinking toward non-physical dimensions of infinite consciousness or infinite space or infinite emptiness or nothingness or the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception, I would know these distracted mind states as fabricated. This has been a common theme here in the last six months because it's, 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 a, it's a teaching that was relevant during the Buddhist time and still just as relevant to today. A lot of modern Buddhism teaches that we should establish ourselves in these non-physical realms as the goal of, of, uh, of Buddhist practice, but also any, est any establishment rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths from a fabricated mind, imagining ourselves to be something other than what we are in this present moment, which is these properties, is a fabrication that can only lead to stress and suffering. They are, as a Buddha says, these, these imaginary non-physical establishments in, in the uh, Loka Sutta, this would be called non-becoming, is simply rooted in an imagination rooted in fabrication. So even if it's true, I, I don't know why I've been using this, that I'm the world's greatest baker and I'm acknowledged worldwide as the world's greatest baker, the establishment in my mind is still an, an imaginary establishment because in reality, I'm not the world's greatest baker. I'm just these six properties. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So anytime we try to do that with ourselves, it might be um, another example I thought of. Somebody says that eating mushrooms is good for you. So now I decide that I'm going to eat as many mushrooms as I can every day. And in my mind, I'm start, what, what's most important to me day by day is that I'm getting enough mushrooms in my diet. That's, it may be true, but it's a distraction also. Because now the most important thing in my life is getting the right mushrooms, not sitting down and meditating and developing the eightfold path. It's a fabrication that that is, that supersedes the importance of awakening. And any self-establishment is a, in that way is a fabrication. It, it, and please, I, I can't see you in the back row, so just please answer. Is that r really clear to you? Yes. Because it's, it really is a central theme in the Buddhist Dhamma. It's not just this idea of engaging in mystical practices is not part of the Buddhist Dhamma. It's not. But getting to the heart of it is any self-referential view is a fabrication. And so convenient self-referential views is I'll establish myself in a dimension of infinite consciousness, infinite space, et cetera, et cetera, or as the world's greatest baker or the world's greatest bowler or the world's greatest meditation teacher. They're all fabrications and they're all, they will always distract from awakening, even if it's within a so-called Dhamma practice. And now remember the Buddha's teaching, Pukasati, remember the beginning of this, he is well grounded in the Dhamma, but the Buddha sees something in him that requires this refinement to, in, fa in effect, he's, he's telling him, be cautious because he knows all the other teachers and the other spiritual disciplines around Northern India at the time teach basically the same thing. They teach establishment in non-becoming or a non-physical imaginary realm, which when looked at closely, and this isn't a knock on all religion, but religions tend to do that, don't we? If we do things right in a non-physical way, we can establish ourselves in everlasting happiness. The, the most uh, predominant form of modern Buddhism teaches just that. If you say this particular chant over and over again, and particularly if the chant is on your lips when you die, whenever that is, you'll be instantly taken to Abhida to Tulsi to heaven, the Buddhist heaven, and forever and ever you'll be taken care of by Abhidhamma Buddha. Sounds very similar to, to other religions, doesn't it? And maybe it's true, but it's not something the Buddha taught because it's not teaching us what to do with what's occurring now. How can I take care of my mind now? How can I be at peace? And how can I develop a peaceful and calm mind now? How can I? If I think my reward isn't now, my reward is after I die or a million lifetimes in the future. 
the Buddha realized that does nothing for the human condition as defined as these six properties. The, the, the great freedom that comes from understanding that we are just these properties and nothing else is the freedom to take those six properties and be at peace with them. And if we're anything other than self, no, the Buddha never said there's no such thing. If we're anything other than what is described here, it's fabricated and it's prone to confusion, deluded thinking, and ongoing stress and disappointment. Sounds like the end of the sutta, but it's not. <laughs> <clears throat> A wise Dhamma practitioner does not fabricate or mentally construct for the sake of self-establishment in this physical realm or any fabricated or imaginary non-physical realm. It, it, that, that to me is a, is a stunning line when I relate to my Buddhist practice before I came to what the Buddha taught, because most of what it's taught is to establish yourself in fabricated imaginary non-physical realms, whether it's to, to meditate long and hard enough to find this inner Buddha nature, or at some future date, it's often presented as, and if you do this practice, whatever it might be, endless eons from now, you can awaken. That's what the Buddha is describing here. This is not what he's after. He's after developing practical, useful understanding of a human life. And it's described very clearly and impersonally as these six properties. I'm going to go back to that. A wise Dhamma practitioner does not fabricate or mentally construct for the sake of self-establishment in this physical realm or any fabricated or imaginary non-physical realm, period. Fabrications abandoned. This one is not sustained through craving. Again, dependent origination. Where does craving follow? From feeling. Where does feeling follow? From contact. Where does contact follow? From the sixth sense base, et cetera, et cetera, all the way back to ignorance. This one is not sustained through craving. This one is released from clinging to anything in the world, clinging to any phenomenon. This one is no longer agitated. Their mind is calm and well concentrated. This one knows their mind is calm and well concentrated. That's another so it's such, such an important line. How do we know that we're developing the Dhamma correctly, that we're engaged in an authentic Dhamma practice? We haven't adapted, accommodated, or embellished it in any way because it will develop a calm and peaceful mind. And if it's not, if we find ourselves in a Dharma practice for many, many years, and we find that we're still confused or deluded as to what it is, and our minds are still agitated, you probably have adapted, accommodated, or embellished the Buddha's Dhamma. This one knows their mind is calm and well concentrated. This one knows birth is now ended. Remember, birth of giving birth to another moment rooted in ignorance. Birth is now ended. A life well integrated with the Eightfold Path has been lived. My task is complete. There is nothing further in this world. Again, what, what it means is that there's, not, there's no phenomena left in this world for me to cling to and to continue my ignorance and my stress and suffering. The Buddha now references Pukasati. Now remember the beginning of this, Pukasati didn't know that he was sharing a hut with the Buddha. Now he's starting to get an idea. <laughs> Friend Pukasati, when sensing a feeling of pleasure, understand it as impersonal and as such impermanent. Remember the Anatalakana Sutta, if it's impermanent, how could it be me? How could it be us? This is not me, this is not mine. Understanding thus, craving and clinging vanish when we stop self-identifying with phenomena. Understanding thus, craving and clinging vanish. Likewise, when sensing a feeling of pain, or sensing a feeling of pleasure, or, uh, or neither pleasure nor pain, understand these feelings as impersonal and as such impermanent. And they are, aren't they? In fact, usually as soon as we, unless it's an actual physical injury, when we remove our attention to whatever the feeling or emotion is, it vanishes. Understanding thus, craving and clinging vanish. Understanding brings the awareness that pleasure, pain, and neither pleasure nor pain are impersonal and as such impermanent and are not craved after or self-identified with. 
when feeling pleasure, pain, or neither pleasure nor pain, a wise Dhamma practitioner remains disjoined through lack of self-identification from these feelings. Disjoined is another, the Buddha often describes the, the problem of self-referential and self-identification, those types of views as joining with or clinging to straight, uh, pain and suffering, clinging to dukkha. And we really do that. We join with our, with our suffering. So awakening a wise Dhamma practitioner remains disjoined from those feelings. They're just feelings. They're just things that arise and pass away. The, that's why a, a proper meditation practice, the way we practice it, is both metaphor and a practical experience of just that. Things arise and pass away. We come back to the sense, to our sensation of breathing. We maintain our concentration while feelings and thoughts arise and pass away. And off our cushion, the same thing occurs. We don't get entangled with our feelings and thoughts anymore because we've trained our mind. And we have a framework for seeing these things clearly. This one understands feelings in the body are limited to the body. Can anyone explain why that's such an important line? Instead of, I want to hear you teach me a little bit. <laughs> feelings in the body are limited to the body, relating to those six properties. And why that's impersonal. I mean, if, you, if it's just the feeling, if, if there's no clinging or craving or judgment with it, it's just in the body. Yeah, it's happening within those six common properties. Mm. So what? It's not happening to me unless I self identify with it. Mm. And so if I self identify with the earth, the fire, the wind, the liquid, the space, or the consciousness property, any one or all of them, now I'm personalizing the experience. So your body is, is just the earth property. It's just a, another aspect of earth property. Yep, and, how, and that relates directly to five clinging aggregates, foreign feeling perceptions, mental fabrications, and consciousness. It's all intertwined in that way. Mm -hmm. The Buddha uses the, the, the visual of five clinging aggregates to describe the ongoing personal experience of suffering. And this is another way of looking at just those, those same it, clinging aggregates. There's nothing personal about these properties. And yet the, use this word, I'm going to use it anyway, the miracle of this, even though there's no miracles in the Dhamma, is that it is within that recognition of the complete ordinariness of who and what we are, that we are released mm. and are able to have a meaningful experience of life as life unfolds and if we don't we won't what was is what may be isn't we have to be here we have to be now we have to be present and we cannot be present if we're protecting the earth property or the fire property the wind property if we think we're going to lose it you know what i'm saying or need to get more to to enhance this because this isn't enough it doesn't matter because it's all we have, but it's everything. Do you see, and, the, and seeing things clearly doesn't diminish anything. In fact, it, I don't even want to use the enhance, it doesn't enhance it, it sees it in its most ordinary but miraculous way. Is that clear? Yes, yeah. no? Yeah. You go out today, you're going to get a wet ass. <laughs> it could. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> this one understands feelings in the body are limited to the body. It's just what's occurring here. This one understands feelings limited to the human life are limited to the human life. Same, same kind of idea. But no matter what struggles I've had in this life, it's just part of having a human life. And it seems like some people have more struggles or more dukkha than others. But within that, these, these six properties, it's all just what's occurring. There's nothing personal about it. And the fact that um, suffering isn't, doesn't seem to be equal across different persons is completely irrelevant because it is impersonal no matter how extreme it might be individually. That's, the, that's seeing things in its discrete and true unity way. 
There's nothing personal about any of it. So the fact that my, my brother might become emperor and I, I end up living on a street really doesn't, is not a, it's not a commentary on it. Th this isn't fair. One of the interesting things that the Buddha understood, although he didn't have this label, is the second law of, of thermodynamics, entropy. Entropy very briefly says that for one thing, all things are in a state of constant decay, but there's also an uncertainty and arbitrary chaotic nature to all things. Nothing can be strictly defined or, um, or strictly directed, no matter how much we want to. And we only want to when we're self-identifying with phenomena. I didn't mean to get too deep into that. <laughs> this one understands that with the ending of life and the breakup the, of the body, that all that is experienced and not joined to will go cold, cold and end right there. But we just see that this is, this is our human life. While we have it, we have an opportunity to awaken, but we don't know when that's going to end. I don't want to give away the ending. <clears throat> just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on wick and oil, from the termination of wick and oil, it would be unnourished and cease. In the same manner, when a wise Dhamma practitioner is feeling a feeling limited to the body, they understand, I am sensing a feeling that is limited to this body. It's impersonal. When a wise Dhamma practitioner is feeling a feeling limited to human life, they understand I am sensing a feeling limited to human life. That, that's also a broad description of dukkha. And uh, Helen brought up something about compassion last week. It, already, it was such a profound question. Um, and I was thinking about this. She'll be here on Tuesday, hopefully, and I can address it then. But this idea of the bodhisattva idea or I need to be helping others. The world is in such a terrible place. I really shouldn't be meditating or I at least should be putting some time and effort into helping others. And we should be compassionate beings. But we should also understand that as a consequence of having a human life, everyone is in the same boat. There will be dukkha. There will be suffering. And this, the, the, the most profound and useful and skillful thing is to awaken ourselves so that we understand the nature of suffering in the world, including other people. And most importantly, how we can teach other people not to stick that second arrow in because of their own ignorance. And we can't do that until we develop its own understanding. So the most loving thing we can do, according to the Buddha and me, is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. If we really care about other people, and that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be helpful along the way. I'm sure the Buddha was, and we will be. But if we are really concerned about the human condition, and we should be, not to the point of distraction, we take to the Dhamma and awaken. And we better do it quickly because, I'll tell you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, in this manner, when one has the highest determination for understanding, these are the four determinations the Buddha's referring to, remember last week? When one has the highest determination for understanding, meaning developing the Four Noble Truths, for the knowledge in the, of the arising and passing away of, stress and, of suffering and stress, this one has achieved the greatest noble understanding. This one has achieved the greatest noble understanding, understanding the nature of the arising and passing away of stress and suffering. This Dhamma practitioner has gained release from all views, ignorant of four noble truths, so there's no fabrications and the rest of it. This mind has established right view now resting in the pure truth. This view no longer will flush, this, this view no longer will fluctuate due to distraction. This one knows whatever is deceptive and remains free from associating with deception. This Dhamma practitioner is established with the highest determination for the truth. This is the foremost unbinding from wrong views and is the highest noble truth. Formerly, when still ignorant of Four Noble Truths, this Dhamma practitioner foolishly craved after mental acquisitions and created self-identities clinging to these mental acquisitions. This Dhamma practitioner has completely abandoned them. Through the Eightfold Path, this one has cut fabrications off at the root of ignorance. Remember where this all began, from ignorance to fabrications. Through the Eightfold Path, this one has cut fabrications off at the root of ignorance. Like the stump of a palmyra tree, now deprived of the conditions of sustenance, 
fabrications will no longer arise. What are the conditions of sustenance? Ignorance. Likewise, when still ignorant of four noble truths, this Dhamma practitioner foolishly was driven by desire and self-infatuation, by ill will and hatred, by de delusion and ignorance, and created self-identities clinging to these unskillful qualities. Now this Dhamma practitioner has completely abandoned them. Through the Eightfold Path, this one has cut fabrications off at the root of ignorance. Like the stump of a palmyra tree, now deprived of the conditions of sustenance, fabrications will no longer arise. This Dhamma practitioner has established the highest determination, the highest determination for calm, for the calming of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking, the three defilements. This one has established the highest noble calm. This Dhamma practitioner knows to never neglect right view, to always guard the truth, and to always train for establishing a calm and well-concentrated mind. That's pointing to directly to the Buddha's teachings on right meditation and the entire Eightfold Path. This Dhamma, under, this Dhamma practitioner understands where, through wise restraint, the currents of speculation and supposition do not flow. The currents of speculation and supposition that would <laughs> otherwise lead us to non-becoming and establishing ourselves in imaginary non-physical realms or non-physical concepts of who we should be even as a Buddhist practitioner. This Dhamma practitioner understands where through wise restraint, the currents of speculation and supposition do not flow. The, the difficulty is a mind not engaging in a concentration practice, but a mindfulness practice that is grasping after everything that arises will constantly be chasing after speculation and supposition because it needs to. It can't, it can't, there's nothing, there's nothing to, to establish a footing on. But a meditation practice that is solely for the purpose of deepening concentration and framed by the Eightfold Path will lead to the release that the Buddha is talking about here. It's free of supposition and speculation. The currents of speculation and supposition do not flow. This one is known as a sage at peace. Oh. <laughs> With reference to what I am saying, saying to you, all of the following is speculation and supposition. This is, this again, this is like the Dhamma in a nutshell. I am, I am this, I will be, I will not be. I will have this form, I will not have this form. This is again, so important to the people that insist that the Buddha taught. Many of the Mahayana traditions and even the Theravada tradition says that you can, you know you're awakened when you have certain psychic powers. The Buddha never said that, in fact, there's a few suttas I'll be teaching shortly that he speaks directly to that. But in here he says, I will have psychic powers. I will not have psychic powers. I mean, that this is just a part of speculation, supposition, and constant distraction. Um, and that's the same thing as any type of inner Buddha something too. The Buddha continues, speculation and supposition are diseases, a cancer, an arrow. By abandoning all speculation and supposition, this Dhamma practitioner is known as a sage of peace. How do we know that we're not engaging in a practice that is prone to speculation and supposition? Through the Eightfold Path. Excuse me. Quiet mind. That's all that we're after. Again, getting back to this idea of establishment in non-physical realms. When I'm trying to create an idealized, excuse, excuse me, an idealized view of myself, that's speculation and supposition, isn't it? including the idea that there's no such thing as a self or establishing myself in this uh, void of emptiness and nothingness, that's still establishment in a non-physical, non-becoming realm, isn't it? And that's the most common form or the common goal of, of Zen Buddhism, that there's no such thing as a self there's, and everything is nothingness. It doesn't make sense. But that's specific, specifically what the Buddha is teaching here because he went through it himself and he and that was just as common during the Buddhist time. And you can't be you can't be a sage of peace if you're grasping after self-establishment in some imaginary plane of existence, can you? A sage at peace is no longer distracted or agitated by birth, aging, sickness, death, sorrow, regret, greed, aversion, or deluded thinking. With no distraction or agitation, what would this Dhamma practitioner crave for or cling to? 
with no distraction, what is it a crave after? You know? There's simply what's occurring, there's simply what is. This Dharma practitioner understands where the currents of speculation and supposition do not flow. When through wise, wise restraint, the currents of speculation and supposition do not flow, this one is known as the sage of peace. And how do we, again, how do we know that? How do we know we're not engaging in that? We develop the Eightfold Path. That's the proper framework. Now, friend, friend Pukasati, you should remember my brief analysis of these six, these six properties. Not that brief, but. <laughs> then the thought occurred to Venerable Pukasati. Surely the great teacher has come to me. Surely the rightly self-awakened one has come to me. Pukasati rose and bowed to the Buddha and said, I was foolish, confused, and unskilled to address you merely as a friend. Please accept my apology so that I may restrain myself in the future. He's really just, Pukasati's questioning himself that he didn't notice the Buddha right away, but now he does. The Buddha replied, yes, confusion overcame you, but more importantly, you have recognized your confusion. Another, such an important teaching. It's not that we're confused, it's that we recognize it. And in accordance with my Dhamma, have made the strong determination to end your confusion. It is just this determination and discipline that one grows in the Dhamma and practices restraint in the future. Great teacher, please accept me into your order to follow your Dhamma. The Buddha asked, do you have an alms bowl and robes? No, I don't. Then gather a bowl and robes and I will give you the going forth. Going forth means ordination. Pukasati was delighted. He bowed to the Buddha and left in search of an alms bowl and robes for his ordination. While searching, a runaway cow trampled and killed Pukasati. Oh. <laughs> kind of like Bahia, too. Why is that That's what happened. A large group from the Sangha found the Buddha and told him of Pukasati's demise. They asked the Buddha what Pukasati's future state would be. Again, they're, now they're getting into speculation, aren't they? Friends, Pukasati was wise. He practiced the Dhamma in accordance with my instruction. I love this line. He never pestered me with unrelated issues. <laughs> he has abandoned the five fetters of self-identification, grasping at rituals and practices, doubt and uncertainty, sensual craving, and deluded thinking. He is now free of fabricated views that and will never again be subject to the suffering born of ignorance. They didn't, the Buddha didn't describe where Pukasati is. He said he's completed the task. Those that heard these words of the Buddha were delighted. That's the end of this great sutta. Thank you. Um, well, okay, let's, it's gotten a little bit. It's 10 o'clock. Does anybody have to leave early? Because I'll ask you first if you have any questions or comments. Good. Lorna? Can I just ask a question? First? Sure. That's... I the only thing I didn't get out of that was in terms of terms of manipulation of gold. Um, I didn't understand how that fitted into the Dharma. The, the, the Buddha is just using that as a metaphor of, of we can, the, a, a good goldsmith will take a raw piece of gold right. and manipulate it, massage it into what is something useful and beautiful. And we can do the same thing with right mindfulness with our own minds. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, well, um, <laughs> well it's, it's a wonderful sutta, but um, who's this? Luchigabi or whatever it is? Pukasati. Pukasati. <laughs> I mean, he must have had the shock of his life <laughs> when it got out of this. <laughs> Meditation with the Buddha. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's an incredible run through of um, what the what the Dharma is all about, really. Yeah. Um, it really is. And the description of the difference of going through the process to your point where you have got control of your speculative thoughts, etc., that when you do have a peaceful mind is is um, very enlightening and thrilling and yeah. it probably keeps you going really. When you hear things like that, it uh, makes you realize what it, it's possible if you work at it. Um, and the wisdom in 
the wisdom of working out your thoughts like this is so relevant. It comes through really very mm. clearly that it, it's worthwhile. Yeah. Um, it's all worthwhile doing for our own peace of mind, no matter how far along the path we get. We might all not get to the end, but what progress we do make along the path would be worthwhile. It's of immediate benefit. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Let me get uh, Mary. Why don't you have anything to say? Good to see you this morning. Do I need to un unmute your? Okay, you're both unmuted. Good morning. What do you think of the sutta? Hi, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, Mary. Good morning. Okay. No, it's, it's good. It's um, worth thinking about. And it occurred to me that we're all responsible for looking for the eye making in our own practice too. That's yeah. something that I, I kind of picked up on and thought that's something I should pay attention to. Um, but all very good. Thank you for doing this, John. Yeah, thank you for joining. Yeah, that, that really is that lies at the heart of this and the heart of the Buddhist teaching as I make it. How are you, David? Good morning, John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, it just brings me to think about the mindfulness students and how mindfulness is also remembering, remembering, keeping in mind yeah. uh, these these lessons of the Dhamma, that they all are interrelated, they, they support each other, and to keep in mind these lessons, and, you know, they're told in different ways, but they all point to the same, same few premises of what we're, we're learning. So, uh, again, thank you for your teaching, and I'll see you Tuesday. Great. Thank you both. Um, yeah, that, that is, again, the, the essence of it, the, the holding in mind is the holding in mind the framework of the Eightfold Path is how we develop right view and know how to hold things in mind, including this is such a basic teaching on the ordinariness of self. So why make a big deal over it? You know? Jen, good to see you this morning. Good to see you too. Um, this, this kind of got, uh, reminded me of, of so especially the part where he was saying the physical um, things that arise in the physical body are just arising, just limited to the body, something like that, um, is, you know, the phenomenon arising within the body, whether it's a physical sensation or pain or an emotion, it's just arising and passing away without any input. Um, it's not mine yeah. it's just happening and you know that you oh just stop stops the second arrow you yep. just are remembering it's just arriving and passing away on its own there's nothing I need to do there's no me in it it's just what's occurring and then um, also in terms of like the compassion for others, you know, you always say the most compassionate thing you can do for others is a weekend. Um, I, I'm also, and I, and I see that, I, I see that struggle that certain, that people have where they see someone else suffering and they want help. Um, but as soon as you do that, you're 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 making their suffering your suffering. You're yeah. deciding that this is something I have to fix. Yep, yeah, you're joining with it. You're joining with it. Yeah. You've already joined with your own suffering over their suffering, and now you're even going further outside yourself and saying, now I need to manage their suffering, and then you're 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 lost. Yeah. And you're not gonna you're not gonna be skillful at all or helpful to, to anyone yeah. yeah and that so it's not true. that you're not helping them i guess that was what i want to say it's not that you're not helping them it's that you're that you're helping them 
in a way that you um, that that doesn't have ego in it. Yep, in in, in a way that is, is most not, skillful uh, and right. and not most helpful. Making, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Good to see you this morning. Good to be here, John. Well. <clears throat> That's a lot of food for thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's it seems to me that there that I know people and that there are people out there who may not know anything about Buddhism but um, are practicing it anyway, not knowing. And some of them, you know, people who have. Uh, they seem to have a lot of well-being and peace of mind and very accepting of things that happen. And those people uh, I know, uh, they're devout Christians. But they don't know that they're also Buddhists. They, are, they, they don't know that they're Buddhists? They don't know that they're practicing Buddhism. I don't know oh. that they... Uh, but maybe it just comes naturally to them to be accepting of things that happen and not attributing, attributing them to anything in particular. I don't think there are people that say God is punishing, God is rewarding. Um, I think their faith helps them accept that things just happen. And that sounds like Buddhism to me, or some of the attributes of it. Uh, and I think that seems to me like a wonderful way to be. Um, and of being devout and having faith in, okay, um, going to heaven or whatever. But, but it just doesn't seem it's mutually exclusive what and is christian you know some forms of christianity <coughs> and the way some of these people really are they are you know i would call them you know it's like good christians and there are a lot of christians out there that are practicing bad behavior and things like that and very un buddhist like behavior uh but then there are others that um uh, overlap with it and no, they may, they're may they not going to be fully awakened, but those people have a lot of equanimity about, about life, about things, about things being very accepting of things that happen, and that they're, they are not being punished or rewarded that way. They're, they're just, their faith makes them that way. And it's, you know, it's not Buddhism, but it sort of is. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know that th the fact that that certain followers of a certain religion um, are relatively non-reactive means that they're practicing. The, the, the Buddha didn't just say an awakened mind is calm. He said that awakened mind has a profound understanding of the nature of stress. And the result of that, because of that understanding, is calm. So it, it really is... the, the the outer appearance might look the same, but the underlying foundation for the feeling of equanimity is quite different. And, and again, yeah. notice the words I'm using. It's not better or worse. Mm -hmm. It just is. And um, for me, being brought up Christian, knowing that if I did everything right, that's, that I would be rewarded for that, which is really the basic teaching, did not bring any real calm to me. It did to my parents, you know, and I, in fact, my mother was, a div I mean, you know, it, it did for her. Um, it's kind of like a question that, that Drew asked, and I didn't quite take the, uh, take the meaning. And he, he, he the, I don't remember the exact question, but the, the question to me was, am I saying that the Buddha was the only enlightened being? And I really didn't answer it in that context, but what, as I thought about it, it depends on what you're describing as enlightened, because there was a lot of people that we could claim as enlightened. You know, go back to the to the uh, Roman and Greek 
philosophers and, and all people all through history uh, into modern day. And I always think of like Nelson Mandela or, or Dr. King. In their way, they were certainly enlightened beings, Gandhi. The difference was that the Buddha, as an enlightened being, taught a very specific path that no one else ever taught. And it's a path that if people are interested in utilizing it, it's very effective at developing an understanding of the nature of suffering and a common peaceful mind that is not based on anything outside of its own understanding. And to me, that that's a significant difference. But uh, I, I, I also understand just what you're saying. You know, I know there are people, whether they're, they're, you know, what, whatever religion, um, and they could be atheists <laughs> or whatever, um, but yeah. that they, and some people seem to have kind of a natural affinity to be um, uh, accepting, more accepting of things that happen to them, whatever they are, and, yeah. uh, and have this peace of mind. Yeah, there's, there's I, I know a lot of people like that. You know, that, but again, that's not that's not the definition of what the Buddha is trying to teach. You know, it's, it's something different. So, but yeah, it, it it it's not. I mean, if it's di well, it is different, but I, I'm not sure whether there's anyone out there. It's almost to me like achieving enlightenment that I'm not sure there's any such thing as 100%, except for maybe the Buddha. Well, I would that, agree with that, and that's one of the differences for me. Which is, which is this, um, which is some sort of, there is some, there is, there's a name of this, par there's a paradox of, uh, and I don't really know what it is, but I think I've read about it, which is that, if you have um, something, it could be divided in half. And if there's something, you should be able to divide it in half. But you get to a certain point. So if you take a piece of paper, you know, I don't even if it's a molecule, but you get to a certain point. Is there a certain point where you can't divide? You know, you can't divide in half. But if there's anything that exists, you should be able to divide it in half. I'm not describing it right, but it's a, it's a paradox of um, matter or something, you know. But no, I know you. I, scientist, but that you can you can like keep you can get closer and closer and closer. You can divide how close you are to awakening in half and half and half, and at a certain point, you kind of can you ever get there because then you can't divide that in half. Well, you're 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 relating this to to uh, quantum mechanics. Yeah. And, that, and that ultimate last understanding that they can't seem to grasp that the Buddha did. He said, it doesn't matter. He, he said, and even it's in here, don't, the, the past doesn't matter, the future doesn't matter as far as our happiness is concerned, as far as our peace of mind. And so he taught a very specific path that I've never come across anywhere else that teaches us how to live fully as human beings without the need of a uh, belief in an outside agency of any kind. Not that that's right or wrong, but it's a very concise and direct teaching. And it has a very specific goal. It's not looking at salvation. In fact, it's, it's really not meant to, to just make us feel good in an in a existential sense. It, it's making us to, it teaches us to realize who and what we truly are. And there's nothing else that teaches that that I've ever come across. So again, I'm not discounting it. I've, I've, I've studied most religions and uh, they, don't, they don't seem to be concerned with these same teachings. No, In right. fact, they're often, religion is, most religions that I've ever studied, there's one or two that didn't do this, they are designed to answer the great questions or provide an answer so that people will believe in their, um, in their religion itself that the Buddha says, don't concern yourself with. They're, they're, they're not useful. The questions themselves are distracting. Don't worry about where you came from, where you're going. Worry about who you are. And that's the difference. A, a very interesting discussion. Thank you, Lisa. Mary, good to see you this morning. Good to be here. Um, thank you all. Very pleased to take a moment to bow. And, you know, good to see you, John.
when you hear, <laughs> yeah, Mary. When you hear the explanations, um, everything sounds so logical and makes so much sense. Um, but it's, it's, it's difficult to take it all in and it's difficult actually to do it. Yeah. Um, I also, I mean, you say that the past doesn't matter, the future doesn't matter, but the truth of the matter is there are changes in the brain due to having suffered trauma. Yeah. And that's not something you can take away. Yes, but I, I think you can, and, and you, you can learn that that's what, what's occurred. And, and from that point on, you can develop understanding. And, Most people can. And, and accept it. Yeah, I, I don't even know if it's accepting it. It's simply that's what, what has occurred. Okay, yes, I know that most, like, I don't, um, some people would argue with this, but I think most people that have had extreme levels of drug addiction have, to me, I've, and I've worked with hundreds, if not thousands of them, they have the classic symptoms of PTSD. Yeah. Um, and I've seen people that have use this way of living to put all that behind them, in fact, rather quickly. So, uh, and I might, be, I might be missing your point too, Mary, but the, the point of the Dhamma is that no matter where we are, I mean, there's some people that have, that have done such uh, a level of organic damage that there may be nothing that's gonna help, you know, even this. That's, I mean, but you're, you're talking about the effects of the drugs on the brain. Yes. But the effects of trauma in and of itself does change the brain. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not something that you've taken in that has, you know, damaged your brain. It's simply, you know, it's just the way the human brain works. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we were talking last week, and, and we know that this type of work, whether it's, you know, the, the specifically the Buddha's Dhamma or just mindfulness practices have a direct impact on changing the brain chemistry as yeah. well, yeah. which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep moving forward here and go home and listen to this again. I mean, there's, there's so much in this to it. There's yeah, so much in this to it. it really is. This is this is one of those remarkable yeah. sutras that has some, I'm glad you're here. Kevin, good to see you. Good to see you too, John. Good to see you. Um, yeah, this is um, it's just really deep and really there's so much to it. But in a way, too, it's it's also very simple. You know, it's really mm -hmm. just that the you know, the truth underneath all paths, and that's what the Buddha taught. And this is just another deeper way of looking at it. So it is very difficult, but you know, maybe it's right here. Yeah, it is right here. Thank you, Jay. Good to see you this morning. How are you? Thank you very well. Um, I think peace of mind is a wonderful thing uh, in bits and pieces as you can attain that for whatever reason, uh, whether it's pharmacological or by studying a philosophy. Um, when you come to realizations of any kind, eventually you still got to live the rest of your life. And I guess you go to the Eightfold Path and, you know, some of the things that you, you can spend your uh, time on or compassion for other people who are suffering. Yeah. That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Andrew, good to see you this morning. Uh, Jay said there's an awful lot here in the sutra, so it's not a for me to go back and listen to several times <laughs> yeah. afterwards and um, take it in, uh, take more in than I could retain. Yeah. You know, there is, there's a, there's a lot. That's why we're breaking it up. Uh, and I'll, I'll have this talk on up uh, later on today too. So. Uh, I think that's it. We'll finish with uh, with Meta as we always do. So again, find your relaxed meditation, meditative posture. Become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. These are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, 
contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, <clears throat> not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. Pick up the cushions, please.